Good evening and welcome to tonight's live stream here on Dream Bank's Facebook page. My name is Andy Frisky. I am a dream curator here at Dream Bank. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. Uh, I just want to kick things off giving you folks a little bit of context as to uh, what Dream Bank is and why we're here tonight. So uh, Dream Bank is a free community resource located in the heart of Madison, Wisconsin that is actually put on by American Family Insurance. The reason why Dream Bank exists is to help inspire people to pursue their dreams in large part through the events that we host. So when we're not under a stay at home or excuse me, a quarantine order, we typically host right around 40 free events a month with a wide, a wide a range of various topics. Uh, I'm very excited tonight, though, about the two featured presenters. Um, I've gotten to know them over the, the past few years um, as colleagues and, and uh, as friends as well. They're going to be talking about how to f how finding your success in your career in marriage um, can work for anybody. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Deborah and Lloyd Biddle. Folks, you can go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. We're going to start talking to you, uh, as Andrew said, about finding um, success in career and mar marriage, and we're happy to talk with you about that. So when I was growing up, we're going to take you on a journey throughout our relationship and our life and give you some context of how we have gone through different life circumstances and how that has led us to the point where we are today. 31 years married and still going strong. And Wifey, let me just interject that when it comes to life, everybody wants their life to flourish. And if you're married, then there's like two primary relationships that you want to flourish in. First is your married, your relationship with your, your spouse. And then because most of us spend most of our waking hours working, we want to actually not just uh, spend our, our lives there, but we want to enjoy it. We want to have a sense of flourishing. And so that is what we want to share, what we have learned in both of those pursuits, a happy marriage and happy careers. Thanks. All right. So when I was growing up, I wanted to be a number of things. Chief among them was the president of the United States. I also wanted to be a veterinarian because I loved animals still do except i have really bad allergies so that dream went out the window i um also wanted to be a professional vocalist and i wanted to be a math professor now you notice how she has these great high ambitions and mine were much simpler growing up in chicago on the west side of chicago i just wanted to be uh ernie banks or bob love those were great players and, and back in the day in the 60s and 70s so as time went on, um, I grew up, graduated from high school. I went to um, a public school for, through sixth grade and then went to Catholic school in middle school and an all girls Catholic school for high school. And then I found myself at the University of Illinois majoring in economics of all things and just kind of had a great time there. Probably too great of a time at various points, but that's where I Sorry, that's where I met Lloyd. Um, my second year there, I realized that econ wasn't necessarily for me, so I changed my major to finance. Yes, I was. Uh, I came in, in 82, uh, started in finance. I had an older brother. Uh, he and I were both the first in our families to go to college. My older brother's five years older than I. He went to University of Illinois in Chicago to study finance. So I said, ah, finance was good for him, so it was good for me. Now, the, the most important thing that happened w when I went to college, there was a thing called the U of I bookstore. And back in the day, there was a week long new student week. And I went to this uh, bookstore and looked over at this book display and saw this lovely vision, which oh. was different. And uh, I was a shy uh, freshman, so I don't, I don't remember saying anything to her, but I just remember saying to myself, Boy, she's like a dream. So that was that was uh, eighty two in the fall. So he did say hello, and he stared at me, and I I just remember we kind of smiled at each other, and that was the end of that encounter. The next um, time we met was when I was I think in my junior year, and he was a sophomore. I'll let you tell that story. Yeah, that was actually the second semester of my my freshman year. I was pledging a fraternity. They sent me on a an assignment, uh, one of the brothers, a big brothers, to get a love letter from her. 
from his ex-girlfriend, Deborah. And so that's when we actually met and, and got to know her names. And, and that was kind of the start of a relationship. Now, Debbie and I, we never really dated in college. We, we took a couple of classes together, but we didn't, we didn't actually connect until thereafter. So we took a theater class together, which was kind of fun. And I don't remember what else, oh, maybe an English class. But anyway, um, I graduated from U of I in 1984, sadly without a job, because I graduated during the Reaganomics time frame and just didn't have one when I graduated. I don't know if it was Reaganomics other than a recession. No, oh, well. <laughs> but anyway, so when I was in 84, I met, I was a resident advisor. And so for the last two years of my college career, I worked uh, taking care of students on a dorm floor, probably 30 guys. And one of the things that the president of the university at the time, Stan Eikenberry, did was he called campus leaders to his house and just so happened I was placed at his table. In fact, it just so happened I was sitting next to uh, President Eikenberry and he asked me what I wanted to do with a career. And I was studying finance and I, I really hadn't thought that much about it, but I said, hey, you know, I think I wanna be in banking. And President Eikenberry said, hey, listen, Lloyd, I know the president of First National Bank of Chicago. That's, this was the largest bank in the city of Chicago, 40 billion in assets. And I know the president of the local large bank, which was Busey Bank. He said, I will set up interviews for you, informational interviews. And that is what really, those interviews in downtown Chicago for, I think I was probably a junior, was the beginning of me forming a perspective, a vision for a career. So I, I still remember President Eikenberry to this day. Uh, he's long since retired. Uh, his, his son is a, a college professor, I forget where, uh, but he had a tremendous impact on my life. So my vision for a job was a little bit thwarted. I remember coming out of college, I um, worked at Sears in their dial for service contract section for about two weeks. So marketing. Yes, telemarketing. And then I did more telemarketing for a carpet cleaning company that lasted about two weeks also. And then I got a, one of my favorite jobs ever because I like money. I got to work as a bank teller in at the Bank of Highland Park. And I worked there until I got a job at Xerox in 1985. And in that same year, I knew that my career was not exactly going the way I had envisioned. So I decided I was going to go back to grad school and enrolled at Keller Graduate School of uh, Management part time and also worked another job at Charles A. Stevens, for those of you in the Chicago area who might remember that store, selling shoes. And that was how I spent the next couple of years. Remember, she likes money. That'll be a theme throughout this story. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, uh, by, by 86, I was doing an intern at Northern Illinois Gas Corporation in Naperville. So most of the summers I spent actually in Champaign going to class. But one summer I actually came up and did a finance uh, intern at NICOR. That was also very helpful for me getting a, a career job. In 86, after a year at Xerox, again, because it wasn't quite where I saw myself, I um, wanted to be a financial analyst and Xerox wasn't gonna get me there. So I took a job at Motorola in their billing department. Also not exactly the job I wanted, but I knew Motorola had the potential to launch me into the career path that I really intended, which was ultimately to be a controller. Uh, I started my first job uh, at Continental Bank as an auditor. Continental Bank uh, subsequently was taken over by Bank of America. Uh, but it was a it was a great uh, experience. It was a bunch of uh, young college grads that started at the same time, and uh, and then around this time, Debbie and I started connecting. A strange story, real quick. So uh, I ran into Debbie uh, probably the summer before I graduated. At we we a mutual friend of ours was getting married. I think she was there with a date. She told me where she worked, which was uh, at Motorola in Schaumburg. And uh, when I graduated in December of 86, I just looked her up and I just showed up on her doorstep one day unannounced. Now, now uh, you button uh, folks who are, you know, there might be some single people out here who are uh, pursuing relationships. Don't do that. Don't just show up at somebody's house <laughs> unannounced. But I, I did. And it just so happened she was breaking up with her boyfriend. So it was not a really good experience. And 
when I left her apartment, I was like, boy, what did I see in that lady? Oh my <laughs> goodness, you know. So anyway, that was uh, that was then. Yeah, he showed up unannounced. I was working as a credit analyst at Motorola, and he's right. I had just broken up with a long-term boyfriend and was coming home from work, getting some popcorn, putting on my pajamas, going to sleep, and then getting up every day and doing it all over again. And he came on one of those days, one of those pajama and popcorn days, and it wasn't, I wasn't, let's just say I wasn't at my best. <laughs> Then we did start dating. So this the part of this that I will tell, because he won't get it right, is that I um, checked in with him. I remembered him, and I called him about six months later. And um, he asked me on a date. And then we went out and continued to date until we got engaged about a year or so later. Now, what he will not tell you is that he had a girlfriend at the time he was asking me out on a date. Yes, that's a that's a detour story that you don't <laughs> you don't really need to to know. What what she should have told you was she was going through her little black, black book of <laughs> single men and I happened to be the, so the third I happened to be the third of six calls and she just got uh, she got lucky as on that call and I asked her for a date and, and anyway we started we started uh dating uh and then got engaged. Yes. Not true. See, that's what I mean by he would not tell it right. So, um, in 1989 is when we actually got married. Um, after we got engaged, I moved back home with my parents and lived there until the time of our wedding. And um, at that time, shortly after, I was working as a credit analyst in Motorola Credit Corporation. So I had made a couple of job changes and you'll see that as a theme as we go throughout our career journey. But also um, we were pregnant um, within, I don't know, three months, yeah. three or four months after we got married. And so uh, around this time I started a, an MBA. I think I was out of college for a couple of years. I knew that I was gonna go back. Uh, at the time I was thinking I was gonna have a, a high powered banking career Everybody in the banking career had an MBA in Chicago. The gold ticket was uh, uh, Northwestern's program, which was Kellogg or USC. Happened to get into both, chose Kellogg. My wife got pregnant, and it was a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a, a, a shock. But um, but there's more to the story. So why don't you click through? So. Our daughter was born after about five and a half months. Her name, we named her Christian Nicole, but we called her Millie. Lloyd can tell you the story of why, but she was born premature and um, just we just were not expecting that and we were devastated. Um, she, born, she was born on January 10th and she lived for about 10 hours and then she passed away and she was just teeny tiny small. And, you know, today, if she were born at that point, they would probably be able to save her. But, you know, it's been 30 years now. And so they would not have, they weren't, they didn't have the capability of doing that back then. And that was just a really, really difficult time for us. And we, um, you know, a lot of people wouldn't have, a lot of relationships wouldn't have made it through that. I was fortunate in that my job was, they were just very gracious. They let me take a full maternity leave. Um, they offered all kinds of support in whatever way they could, befriended, and just, they were just great about it. Um, family was there for us and surrounded us, and uh, we leaned on our faith in God and leaned on each other to get through what was a really tough time. And I think it was hard for me, of course, going through the, the labor and delivery of our child and knowing that she wasn't going to make it. And a lot of people focused their attention on me, not realizing that Lloyd was going through the same loss and grief that I was. So I know it was hard on him in a different way. Yeah, uh, uh, we've been married 31 years. By far, this is the most difficult time of our life. Both of us have buried our fathers. I've buried a sister and a brother. Uh, this is by far the very most difficult time to be given your daughter after 20 years, 20 hours of labor, uh, unexpected labor, uh, the doctor telling you there's nothing they can do. 
and then having the, a daughter that looks just like your wife, full head of hair, a new baby smell, die in your arms, uh, difficult. Now, W and I are people of faith. We are Christians. I, professionally, I'm a pastor now, but God had to carry us through this time. I, 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 I came home to our apartment empty, distraught, didn't really know how to comfort myself, uh, flipped open the scripture. It happened to turn to a passage um, in 1 Corinthians 15 that talks about the resurrection from the dead and that there's hope. And so that hope uh, carried us through a very dark time. So um, I finished my MBA in 1991 after a long five years of working on it and then started finally my job as a financial analyst at the Motorola Cellular Infrastructure Division. And that was kind of, it was a long journey, but um, a realization of a dream to actually get the job that I wanted and to finish grad school after having gone through a bunch of jobs that weren't great, working two jobs, you know, getting married, having a child, having that child die, and to finally get that job was a little bit of relief and to also to finish school. I had a similar breakthrough situation, was working on my MBA, which was being pretty much fully paid by Continental Bank, and then I switched uh, jobs to Citibank. So I was uh, auditing. I had a finance degree. Uh, uh, auditing is control management. I hated it. Uh, I, uh, credit management I, at least was officer level. So this, I felt like I was on the right path uh, in this new job. So this was a good time for us career uh, wise, even on the hills of, of Millie's uh, premature death. So I don't know why this is here, but I think one of the principles we wanted to talk about with this slide is just mm -hmm. to say that when it comes to um, mm -hmm. being successful at marriage, it doesn't happen by accident and it doesn't happen um, just because you wish it to happen, that it takes a decision. Um, Lloyd will tell you that I think I told him very early on maybe even one of the first times that we went out that I was not looking necessarily for a casual relationship. I was looking for uh, a marriage and I, that it was till death do us part, which is weird to say early in the relationship. It can scare people away, but you have to decide and you have to commit and purpose to stay together. And we made that commitment on May 27th, 1989. That's when the two became one. And there's our little mm -hmm. picture. It's in black and white because we like black and white, not because we're that old. <laughs> when I started dating Deborah, she was very clear that this wasn't like a casual thing. And uh, after a five or six months, she wanted to know, you know, where was this going? Uh, when we got married, she uh, she has an uncle, uh, Robert. And after the wedding, uh, Robert pulled me aside and said, no, I want you to know something. I live in Michigan. But if I find out you're treating my my favorite uh, niece wrong, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do business. And he had to look on his face. And at the time, he had the strength to to to, to bring it bring it to pass. Uh, no, we we were uh, committed uh, to each other and to Christ from the very beginning. That made a big um, had a big impact on our lives. When Millie died, Deborah's dad and mother were at the hospital. And later on, her father told me that he knew that we were going to make it when he watched me um, care for Deborah and the baby in those hours after the birth. That was a very much a at 24, 25 years old, I would have told you I wasn't really a man that that difficult situation uh, was a uh, defining moment, uh, a transition from kind of boyhood uh, to manhood for me. So when tough times come, lean on one another. So that's one of the things that uh, we just found really important that there's, there's joy that can come through on the other side of tough times and that we have to be really intentional about leaning on and caring for and holding each other up. Yeah. 
Um, uh, later in life, uh, due to just a lot of work pressure, uh, maybe the pressures, the mounting pressures of being kind of the main provider, um, I've had to work through uh, depression. And my wife uh, has been just a great support uh, and my church, quite honestly, of praying, supporting me through. Now, I'm doing great right now. Uh, uh, awesome. I feel great. But there was a there was a period of about 18 months uh, where I was really just struggling uh, uh, with depression. So you might you might be out there and you may have had you may have a similar issue for you. I just want to say that there's hope. And if you're the spouse of someone like that, you should know that there's hope that your spouse can get better. And I've, I had a therapy and, uh, pro, pro, you know, professionally and prayer and scripture reading and lifestyle changes all have helped contribute to me overcoming some of that sh stress. Uh, a lot of it work related, just the pressure of, of different uh, things going on. Uh, yeah. So one of the things that has helped us too is to be able to share our highs and our lows. Um, we both have been in jobs where we've had a lot of stress and we've been in jobs where we've had great joys and responsibilities and just being there talking through that, um, talking through uh, challenges that we've had with other people, uh, relationships, challenges with kids, the whole thing, just being able to have someone, Lloyd's my best friend, I talk to him about everything. And so just being able to have that kind of a relationship where there's nothing that I can't tell him. Um, and so that, that just helps, keeps the line of communication open, keeps us um, just bonded. There aren't any surprises. We just are more connected because of that. Yeah. Don't leave your spouse out of your career. A little bit later on our timeline, I'll talk about a big job risk. I took leaving a, a banking career after getting an MBA and becoming an entrepreneur and uh, 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 telling Deborah about that, uh, getting, getting her approval on that really important. Um, don't underestimate your spouse's contribution to your success. Um, in, in many ways, there's nothing I could have done uh, professionally uh, with that, without her support. Uh, knowing that she was 100% for me, willing to make the sacrifices of time and other kinds of sacrifices for me to pursue certain dreams and, and aspirations. And I feel confident uh, that that it's the, the the same has worked in reverse. That I have been a great supporter for her dreams, and we'll talk a little bit about that later too. Yeah, we'll talk about some of the dreams that we both have had that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had each other's uh, full support in making them come to pass. So, um, in 1992, I was promoted to a senior financial analyst, which again, along my career path, which was a good thing, I ended up working for the European markets of um, Motorola's cellular infrastructure division, which was great for me. I had never worked with an international group, and so that afforded me the opportunity to go to Europe and to just work with people from around the world, and it was a great experience. It required a lot of time uh, more time from for my work. So that was a little bit um, more of a commitment than I had had in previous jobs. But we were able to make it through, I think, partly because Lloyd was still going to grad school. So uh, we were both working hard at the same time. Yeah, it would, it would have been, uh, looking back on it, <laughs> with both of us in grad school, uh, which was, you know, working probably 50 hours a, a week and then mm -hmm. Uh, studying at least another 10 or 12 hours. This was a, this was a busy, a difficult time. And, but, um, but, but God accomplished some good things to us. I finished my, my MBA uh, at Kellogg. Uh, De uh, Debbie and I, uh, at this point in our career, are working for big Fortune 500 uh, companies. Uh, that was kind of what would have been expected of us graduating from U of I. And we were just kind of doing you know, the yuppie, back in then they would have called it a yuppie or a buppy, black urban professional, 
uh, young urban professional. We were doing that in life. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, then I quit my job. <laughs> uh, uh, we had insurance with um, uh, W's agent in Schomburg, uh, Brad Suter. Uh, one day, a uh, real quick story, uh, uh, Brad came to my office at the bank and he wanted to, uh, to sell life insurance to us. And I bought some life insurance. We didn't have our own policies. In the course of that conversation, he said, hey, Lloyd, uh, I think you should think about going into the insurance business. Now, by this time in my career, I was a number cruncher and I realized I hated it. I am, I'm a communicator. I'm a leader at heart. And my job, I was just spending you know, 50 hours a week crunching numbers, generating reports. And I was coming to the conclusion that I hated it. Anyway, Br Brad said, hey, you should become an insurance agent. And I was like, man, I just finished my MBA. I'm just starting to make decent money in the bank. I said, hey, Brad, what, you know, what, what, what kind of money do you make? And Brad was an engineer from the University of Indiana. Now, an engineer from the University of Indiana as an insurance agent. He said, Lloyd, listen, he said, I've been doing this for six years. I'm not that great. But my business is, is generating 300000 Now, this was uh, 1992 or three. That would, that would probably be like uh, half a million, a little over half a million today. And I, and I know a lot more about the insurance business. Uh, Brad was making well in the six figures, and he wasn't even 30 years old. And uh, not a lot of careers at that time would have produced that income. Long story short, I ended up going <laughs> into agency at American Family, American Family was just moving into Chicago in 1993, and I was one of the first agents in the city. And it was a shock to my system because I was expecting us to be in the money through a nice corporate gig since he had just finished his MBA. So when he came home and said, I see, I'm going to be an insurance man, I was like, say what now? <laughs> You're going to do who? Yeah. That was <laughs> and so um, I was still working at Motorola and have been promoted to cost accounting supervisor, which was a good thing for us. But uh, the news of the insurance agent was something I wasn't expecting. Um, I had a vision as I studied the business and recognized that in that field, uh, agents made their money on renewals, not on new business sales. I felt like I could I could do well. And I began to uh, contact a lot of my friends from the University of Illinois and started visiting agents in the area. And I was like, I could make this. I can make this work. Uh, I didn't foresee that my wife was going to get pregnant. <laughs> and so, so so she got pregnant right pretty much right after I started uh, in the in the business. We had our fifth anniversary. And Debbie had some some issues with pregnancy. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So because we found out that I had an incompetent cervix, we um, knew that I was going to have to be on bed rest. So I was on bed rest for seven months with Jason and um, everything that could possibly happen from, you know, six months of morning sickness, uh, pneumonia, uh, all the typical symptoms of pregnancy, I had them. And so that was a really tough time because I had to be at home in the bed and we had just, we had been in our house maybe a couple of years by the time I got pregnant. And um, so I was at home during the day, my mother and my sister would come and help cook and clean and whatnot. So that was a godsend. But um, it was just, it was a tough pregnancy. So I would, I, I learned how to knit and do cross, cross stitch and all sorts of other fun stuff while I was laying around in the bed. And uh, we ended up delivering him, uh, I think a day earlier than his due date. Uh, he was born the day before our anniversary. And after he was born, I was able to take six months off for parental leave, which at the time was very, very generous for Motorola to do because they were usually only giving people six weeks and I was able to do six months. And then um, I went back to work. I was one of the first people in the company to telecommute. They installed these ancient phone lines, which don't even exist anymore today, I don't think. And at the time they were cutting edge. At the time it was cutting edge and they mm -hmm. hooked up a computer at home for me and I worked from home three days a week and went into the office twice a week. And that lasted, I don't know, maybe another six months or so. And then I realized 
because of the times I was out of the loop of what was happening in my career. So decided to go back into work full time. And uh, Jason then went to daycare. Real quick story. Um, so Debbie had a high risk pregnancy and I was working for myself. So I could commute from uh, Westchester, Illinois to downtown Chicago. Well, actually Hyde Park, which is where I worked. And then in the middle of the day, once a week, drive home to Westchester, which would have been in the middle of midday traffic in Chicago, about an hour and 15, pick her up, another hour to Schaumburg, doctor's visit, and then back and then back to work uh, by three in the afternoon to work till eight. It was a brutal period of life for us. It was brutal. But I, uh, God gave me the flexibility to be able to, to take care. I never missed any of those daily, weekly appointments. And so it was a great blessing to me. It was because that was one time during the day where we kind of had together. That was the one time during the week where I could actually go out of the house. And so it was a blessing to have the insurance man <laughs> instead of the corporate man at that particular Even if I only time. made half of what I was making before. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. So should we talk about that? We'll get there. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Jason. He was born on May 26th in 1994 beautiful baby as you can see and that's me just in awe of him and, and this Lord. is me with this look of bewilderment <laughs> now this is 1994 Four. and i am just about 30 years old and i'm like what in the world has she got to be <laughs> into and it's so all about responsibility of uh, being a young husband a uh, father uh, a business owner it's kind of coming down and I'm like, man, how am I going to work through this? And, uh, but, but we, but we made it, we were committed to uh, each other. And um, we were, I, I had a job that I loved, though it didn't pay well at the time. <laughs> and uh, we were to make it through. Yeah. So part of this story I should say is when I went on bed rest too, um, my salary was, at the disability rate, which meant it was cut down to 60%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the while, he was taking probably a, the equivalent of a 60% pay cut from going from banking into agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was, and we had just bought a house and having a baby, and it was a really, really difficult time. A time, again, when many couples might not have made it because of just so much going on. And I, I really think we were able to get through that uh, because of our faith in God, because we were flexible, and because we had a little bit of strength going for us, this fortitude to really, we had committed. So what I talked about before, this determination to commit till death do us part. So we weren't gonna let these obstacles get in our way these things actually probably brought us closer together rather than drive us apart. One thing that I think is a good, it's a good truth, the laundry really can wait, mm -hmm. but it's also a good metaphor for life. There's, there's always something that needs to be done. There's always more you can do, but you need to take time for yourself, take time to build um, some rituals into your life, um, take time to rejuvenate, refresh, and to um, just have some times of respite for each other. If you always focus on your to-do list, you'll never prioritize one another. And it was important for us to do that. When we first got married, um, we would always have these date nights. And and when, even after we had Jason, we would try to get away for a quarter. And I remember my mother saying, well, why are y'all doing that? And we, we just made a commitment that we were going to spend some quality time together and yeah. made it a priority. Yep, every quarter. Now, Deborah has a sister, uh, uh, Karen, and I hope Karen's not listening because she'll get me. But I used to call her Martha Stewart. Stewart. Karen is is uh, particular about home decorations and decor. She is the hostess with the mostest, right? <laughs> and so, and now my wife had me and then before too long, uh, three other, uh, two other sons. And so there these three sloppy people. And so so she had to we had to learn during this time to focus on the things that that mattered. And having house beautiful wasn't as high a priority 
uh, during this time. But being together um, was was more important to us. So continuing on. So in 95, I was promoted to the project manager at Motorola Cellular Infrastructure Division. And so what I want, I, you probably noticed, I have a lot of promotions in my career path. And part of it is because I wasn't, um, I just never was satisfied with just staying in the same job forever. Um, I think God gave me a lot of favor during those years, but I also worked hard. Um, I did not have the best of, I don't know, I wasn't, I was naive and overzealous and I didn't have uh, the best networking skills back then, <laughs> but I did work hard and I, I, I was smart. So I could get ahead from that perspective. And um, I think it, it paid off well. I learned a lot about what to say, what not to say, and how to work and how to be smart and how to build relationships. I learned it the hard way, but I did learn it. And so uh, while I'm at American Family, uh, taking a 50% pay cut, but I'm learning how to run an agency, uh, how to hire staff, how to fire staff, how to grow a business from nothing. So in two and a half year period, I grow, grew a business uh, from zero to a million dollars in earned premium and uh, about 110,000 of gross revenue in two and a half years. But for the time, that was pretty strong. Did so well that the company uh, promoted me to sales manager. And um, it turned out that um, uh, I took a 50% pay cut in job in 1993 or so and by this time of 96 i had uh pretty much doubled what i had earned when i left the insurance career and that's what the the uh, the banking career and that was the potential that i saw uh it took a risk but i had enough confidence in myself and the opportunities before to to go for it and so this speak, this comes a time, this starts a time when economically we begin to do pretty, really well as a family. And I will say um, we had a great support network and I know not everyone yeah. has that, but however, if you can be intentional about building a support network, because an opportunity came for me to take a job at Abbott Laboratories, which at the time was about 45 miles from where we lived. And I took a job as a financial analyst and in less than six months was promoted to um, controller in their engineering division, which was my dream job. And I wouldn't have been able to do that work because I was working 60, sometimes 70 hours a week, had my mother not retired early and agreed to be my child care provider for some of those days for Jason. And it was just a huge blessing for her to do that. And it allowed me to, you know, live out my dream of having this job as a controller, which was a lot of work and a lot of pressure, very stressful. We both were in kind of high commitment kind of jobs at this point in our careers. But as Lloyd said, it was high reward for a lot of commitment. Yep. Uh, at this time, I'm starting to feel a call to the preaching uh, ministry. Debbie and I were uh, serving at a church in, well, we lived in Westchester. Deb worked in, uh, in, in North Chicago, Lake County. We ended up joining a church out in that area in Waukegan that uh, kind of nurtured uh, me. De Deborah uh, had a thriving uh, music ministry at every church that we've been at. And how we ended up at this church actually was she was invited to come to be a guest uh, soloist and I came, I, I liked it, we joined the church and um, I felt God calling me to the preaching ministry. This started out uh, me on a path of getting a second master's degree uh, at Wheaton College. Uh, so that started in 1997. So one of the yeah. things that has been impactful for us is to develop and keep some rituals. Yep. Um, we like to celebrate. We celebrate birthdays and all the holidays we can think of. And we celebrate our, with ourselves and we celebrate with our extended family. Um, Lloyd's family has a practice of renting out a hall every Thanksgiving and, and like a lot of people pile in there. It's a big giant potluck with probably 
I don't know, at times up to probably 150 people have come over the years. And then they used to also do a uh, summer family reunion picnic kind of a thing. And we always make sure, I mean, we're rarely ever at home on the holidays because we're going to one of our relatives place to, to celebrate. And so that's part of, that's really important for us. Um, we have rituals when our kids were young and, and in the house still, we would pray together with them every day before we left to go separate, to go to work and to school. Um, Lloyd and I still pray together um, nearly every day. And mm -hmm. so those things just become important. And like I said, a, a ritual that we're starting to establish now because our, our sons are adults now is we've made a commitment to go on vacation together every year and just have some some family time because that has been important to us all throughout our, our lives with them and we want to keep it that way. So last year I did a, a, a wedding in Holland, Michigan. If you are, um, we, all of you probably, many of you are in the Midwest, there's some jewel beaches in, in Michigan. Uh, we, we, so we brought our, our sons with us a little later. We came back maybe a month later. That was our first family vacation. This year we were planning in May to go to Mexico. Mexico and the boys had, you know, one had took off work, the other had finished school. And of course, you know, with COVID-19, we had to cancel that. But we will find another place because they have said that they want to, to do uh, uh, a vacation with us every year. Uh, there's a legendary executive at American Family. His name is Joe Tisserin. And every January, I watch Joe. Now, Joe made a pile of money. He could do this. <laughs> uh, take his family to uh, Florida. And his whole extended family, he and his wife, his kids and their kids would go on his dime for a week in Florida every year. Now, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do that, but I, we can make time for three or four days of vacation with the family. Uh, God has provided enough for us to do that. And our sons say that they would value that. And so that's one of the, the rituals that sustained us. Our daily prayer ritual sustained us. We had daily prayers and daily hugs. Uh, I, I didn't grow up in a particularly affectionate family, and that was one of the goals for for my family. I wanted my sons to this day; they'll get hugged and kissed by their father, and they don't they don't look at it weird. And it's because they were nurtured that way. They're 26 and 21, and I'm always hugging on on wifey. She doesn't <laughs> say that it it bugs her or or, or not, but no. but anyway, there's there's certain rituals. When my kids were in my house every Sunday morning so that they would like to go to church. Debbie would sleep in and I would get up and make breakfast for them every Sunday morning. That was our ritual. We did that to probably, they were 13. What, the youngest one was probably 13 when we quit, when we stopped doing that. And so uh, there are certain rituals that really have sustained us and kept us connected as a family. So continuing on with our career journey. So in uh, 1998, we started a ministry called Reasonable Service Ministries. And the reason uh, we started it was we, we were doing a lot of marriage ministry and we have, even before we were married, we had a couple's uh, Bible study with some uh, several of our friends and that evolved for us into marriage ministry, which we have done for many years over the course of our marriage. And we started Reasonable Service Ministry to house that work that we would do as um, in married couples ministry, but also uh, to support or to be a vehicle to do music ministry because I was, I've was i always been very involved in that. And I also established um, Begin It Now, which was my for-profit entity through which I published my first uh, recording. And at that time, that same year, is when I left Abbott Laboratory. So I had my dream job for almost two years to the day and then uh, decided to stay at home with my son, Jason, and also to pursue these ministry opportunities. Now, Debbie is uh, beginning to publish her, her, her music now. I didn't realize that when I married her, I was marrying a Fortune 500 executive and, and now a, a, a music recording artist. And one of the areas of support was I was her executive producer. So, which means I financed these projects, which, <laughs> which all of which cash flowed out, all of them, uh, we were able to make more than what we invested. Mm -hmm. 
in the in the projects. And Wifey, you did two or three albums. I forget which. Which so so she did two albums during this time. An album. Notice that word. He dates himself. Yeah. CDs, which CDs. also dates ourselves. Right. <laughs> but anyway, in 1999, we mm -hmm. celebrated our 10th anniversary, mm -hmm. and it was then that Jared was born, and uh, Lloyd was licensed to preach at that time. So this was a big year, and the record label was started, and my first CD was released. Uh, it was called Worthy Lord, and as Lloyd said, um, we sold out of that CD several times over, and I was able to to tour and perform and uh, minister at various churches across the country, even in the Bahamas, and so it was, it was a good experience and a growth experience for me as a as a worship leader, and uh, I just appreciated his support, the support of my friends who wrote songs, and the support of, you know, everyone involved. Really, it was it it was a labor of love, and God really brought all of that together. Around the same time, my, my mom uh, turned 70. I remember when at this, uh, I preached a sermon at my church. It was right around the time of her birth, uh, of her 70th birthday. So it was a very monumental uh, time. A couple of years prior to this, my dad had died from a heart attack. He had been, had had heart issues. He died at, at 77, but uh, so that, lows and then highs during this period of time. And then in 2001 is when I recorded my second CD and recorded the first song that I ever wrote. Um, and it was called, His Name Shall Be Called. That was the song I wrote and it was the title song for the CD. And it was a song, a collection of Christmas songs. One of the coolest things that ever happened to me in my life is we were over, I think at her sister's house in, what town did your sister live here in Um Where? Your mom was in Gurney. Your sister lived down the. Oh, Grace Lake. Gra her, her mom, her sister was in Grace Lake, and uh, someone called us to let us know that the the title track from from her uh, CD was on like the top gospel station in Chicago, uh, GCI Radio, and so we run out because there was no radio in the in her house. So we go out to her car, our car, turn on the radio, and we're like jam into her song. And it was just such a, a time of celebration. I know how much work she had put in uh, to that project and how much she wanted to bless God, how much she wanted to pursue her life's passion. So it was just a lot of fun. I'm glad you remembered that. Yep. And it was cool because out of all the songs on the album, that's the only one that got on the radio. So <laughs> the one that I wrote. So that was very cool. Yeah. Uh, so this is our... Uh, picture from our website. So uh, working on things together has been important for us. Too. Like we're doing right now. Yes, like we're doing right now. But um, Reasonable Service Ministries, as I said, is the ministry we started. And if you want to visit the website, it's still up and running. It's rsministriesatme.com. Um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. the website. Mm -hmm. And so um, we really were blessed by being able to do marriage conferences. Lloyd still, as part of his work, does marriage counseling and, of course, marries people. But being, uh, laboring in something together brings, it can, it can give you a lot of stress, but it also can really bring you together. You get to learn how each other thinks in a different kind of way, learn um, the skills that uh, you may be, uh, have a deficit in, but your partner will be able to bring out uh, his strengths or her strengths and really be able to help each other and grow something. In this case, just ideas that we had that we were able to put into action and really bless the lives of other people. Also, um, anytime he's had a job or I've had a job, we've depended on each other for advice. And I'll get into talking about that a little bit more in terms of what I'm doing right now. But if I, because he knew about finance and accounting and, and so did I, um, if I had a problem uh, with, you know, rate of return on something or, or anything related to my finance work, I knew I could go to him and he would be able to give me some valuable insight. And even if he didn't understand what I was doing, if I had issues with people, he could talk me through some of those issues. Or if I felt like I had made a, a mistake or I had done something wrong, he could kind of give me some guidance to help me rethink what I was doing. 
And I think at times I've been able to do that with him as well, whether it was working at AmFam or working with the church or um, any of the other volunteer things we might have been involved in. Yeah, I would say um, work on something together. Uh, uh, keys to our success, uh, commit to each other, uh, working on projects together. Uh, whether it's in the the church that we both serve at, uh, me professionally as a minister, her in the music ministry together, our reasonable service ministries together, her current business uh, in many ways, we're working on it together. In fact, this is under the auspices of a people company. And that has also been a key part to our success. We share each other's successes. So, um, support one another in pursuing a passion. As we talked about already, one of my passions is music and being able to record um, original music and perform it and minister it in a variety of places, even here in Wisconsin. Before we lived here, I actually came here. My, one of my first ministry engagements in Wisconsin was at Fountain of Life. Um, I don't even remember the year, but probably around 19, no, probably around 2000 two or 2001 or two. So we've been just able to really support each other in accomplishing those things that God has laid in our heart and purpose for us to do. And one of the things that Lloyd was really passionate about, which he, I don't even know that he was aware of it until it happened, but he was able to go to, on a mission trip to Haiti. And I'll let him tell you about how that came to be. Yes. And uh, there was, um, a woman, we were living in uh, Wadsworth, Illinois at the time. There was a woman who was um, uh, from, from Haiti who um, would put together uh, teams of folks, short-term missionaries to go to Haiti to support her brother who was a pastor in Haiti and who supported a couple of orphanages. So this is a, a picture of uh, some orphans in Haiti. This is about 2003, 2004. And I and a group of about 10 people came down to make uh, benches for the classroom. Uh, just a tremendous ministry that still goes on um, uh, in Haiti. Uh, this woman uh, somehow saw that Deborah was in music ministry and called her and invited us over so she could share with us her her ministry. Uh, now, now, you should know my, my wife, Deborah. She doesn't, uh, you know, this is very rare that she would take a first time phone call from a stranger and then connect our families, but she did. I don't, I don't know what was be, behind that. Ruth, she yeah. was dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> Ruth uh, uh, died of uh, of cancer in her thirties, but she was a dynamo in terms of uh, her love for God, her love for her people, and she was able to rally complete strangers to her cause. Uh, one of uh, Deborah's sister <laughs> and then one of her sister's very best friends uh, donated to this ministry out of this connection. It's amazing how um, Providence works and how God works her to Debbie out of nowhere, to me to go to a missions trip, to Deborah's sister, to, to Deborah's sister's uh, work friend. Uh, our entire church. Our, our entire church sponsored event. event. So just, just an amazing kind of thing. Uh, but all these things uh, come out of uh, us supporting each other's passions. So growth requires some hard choices. Um, this is Jared. Jared was born in, on June 19th, 1999, after six months of bed rest. The hard choice we had to make was to move in with my parents. So I couldn't take care of Jason because I was on bed rest and my mother and father graciously allowed us to move in with them so that they could be my primary caregivers and take care of Jason while Lloyd was working um, and living in Westchester. So that was a hard time weird, for us weird period. because he yeah. was he was working in Glen Ellen yeah. at the time, yeah. and which is about an hour and 40 minutes away from Gurney. And so he lived in our home in Westchester. Then he would come and take me to my weekly doctor's appointment. My mother and father um, took care of me and Jason went to preschool in Gurney. And then Lloyd would come on the weekends and stay with us there. But during the week, except for on my doctor's visit, 
we didn't see him that much. So you should pay attention to this one picture. The, see the smile on this face with the second for five years later. If I could flip you back a few pages, you'd see the frown all on my face or the, 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 shock. the shock. I guess it wouldn't be a frown. It'd just be utter shock. And this is the this is the work of maturation. This is spiritual growth. Um, this is also recognizing. Uh, if you look, uh, Jason is uh, in the first picture to your to your left with his brother. Jason's the oldest son, and then Jairus the youngest. They were fast friends from the very beginning. Um, we were in a house that had four bedrooms. And uh, little Jared was having problems um, uh, sleeping and he was uh, continuing to want to sleep in our bed. So we put them together in the same room in bunk beds. And that was probably Jared was at age two and Jason would have been age seven. They stayed in the same bedroom for. Till J Jason went, went to college. Probably, yeah, until he went to college. And they're the fastest of friends, which has been cool for us to, to see over the years. So one of the things I said earlier is that we need to build a great support system and that it takes a village. The top picture is our family after Lloyd's graduation from Wheaton College. The bottom picture is from Jared's graduation from high school in 2017. So it really does take a village. So whatever you need, make sure you put it in place, whether it's friends, grandparents, nannies, au pairs, child care, daycare, siblings, um, colleagues, whatever you need. Um, there's no shame in asking for help. Mm -hmm. And however you can work the help, there's no shame in that either. Yeah. So just make sure that, you know, you're making friends. Even if you move to a place like we came here to Madison, we didn't know anybody. We have made friends who have helped us with our kids, who have helped, helped us you with your campaign, my campaign when I was running for school board. People have um, just helped us in every way that they could, helped us cut down trees, to move furniture out of our house, just been there for us. So I would say from the time that you get together as a couple, build that support system. Yeah, and so our, our church is our family. And so our kids were raised in youth groups um, with the church. Um, uh, we, we, we built uh, relationships with our neighbors. Uh, it's just so important to have people around you that you support and that important to your lives as well. And also don't forget about the people you meet through school or through clubs that your kids may be a part of or through sports. All of that can be helpful for you. And then decide what's important and stick to it. So for us, it was, we made a choice early on that our family was gonna be our priority. Can I speak to that real quick? Sure. So I'm a, I'm a kid of, of divorce. Uh, my parents were married, man, 20 years, and we were in, uh, we lived on the west side of Chicago in a middle class neighborhood, and then my my parents just kind of got a divorce. Their, their marriage wasn't working. Now, growing up in their household, I knew they struggled in their marriage, though they never talked about it, and it, it, it was clear that they didn't particularly have a happy marriage. Now, how this impacted me was as I grew older, as I came to faith in Christ, as I studied what the scripture had to say about marriage and how to have a successful marriage, uh, I decided that that was gonna be a high priority uh, for, for me. And so, um, so we invested a lot in each other and in our kids. Uh, you hear a lot of, of these days about Black Lives Matter uh, with with the, the meaning that Deborah and I would have is that um, they is that listen um, the 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 ways in which uh, African American especially men uh, really just African American people in general the the ways that society in particular uh, a minority of police officers have been um, mistreating the lives of black people that uh, the community has been saying, uh, pointing out that our lives matter as much as any other person's lives. And so black lives matter. So that's why I stay married to my wife, black lives matter. That's why I stay connected to my kids. Uh, 
uh, Black Lives Matter, and that's why I invest in mentoring in the public schools. Um, and so, so uh, this is really important. This picture is really important to me. I dedicated my life towards having a successful family in the Lord. And so one of the things he didn't tell you, we made some choices um, for our family. We, I stayed home from work um, for a number of years. Uh, we, when my music career was starting to take off, I had the opportunity to be gone quite a bit singing and you know, ministering all over the place. And when it became clear that it just wasn't gonna work for our family, I stopped. Um, Lloyd has had jobs where he could have traveled. I've had jobs where uh, opportunities where I could have taken jobs that would have required me to travel upwards of 50 to 60 or 70 percent. And I making a whole lot of money and I turned them down because we made our family priority. So those are some of the hard choices that you have to make, too. So establish some values. So we came up with our family values and there's just three. One of them is we serve Jesus. The second one is we enjoy spending time together. And the third one is we value accomplishment. Now we came up with this idea, why don't you hit the next slide, from a book that we read uh, written by Patrick Lencioni. Patrick Lencioni wrote a book called The Three Big Questions for a Frantic Family. Uh, as we were raising our parents, uh, our family, one of the things that we didn't do well for a period was we were running ourselves ragged. Uh, even when Deborah had was at home as a full-time homemaker, I was working crazy. Um, um, uh, I, it was w one of the things that kind of caught my attention is as I was kind of growing my career and my income, um, I was watching other dads take time out to put invest in their kids and my kids were getting old my oldest son was getting 13 14 and i hadn't even you know been a volunteer coach for his, his for his baseball team right um uh, but anyway i was i was living a very frantic life we got to a point where our sons were travel baseball my oldest son was a good basketball player a good baseball player club level player jared then had soccer and all kinds of sports. So we were just running cr uh, crazy. And Patrick Lencioni talks about families being needing to determine what they are about so that they can order their lives appropriately. And so, so we did this exercise, what makes our family unique? And so now you can go back to that one slide before. And what we, what we decided is what makes our family uh, unique is that we have always served the Lord uh, we really enjoy spending time together. That's why we're doing that that uh, annual vacation now that our kids are older. That's really important to us. And we value accomplishment. Now, all three of these values made sense to our kids, too. So this was set when they were in our house. And we were like, yeah, this describes us. We serve the Lord. We love spending time together. And we like accomplishments. We like graduating. We like promoting. Deborah likes money. Yeah. <laughs> so these are the things. These are, these are security, security. These are the things uh, beyond security, uh, <laughs> it, 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 eternal security in Jesus. That's a joke. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, know your values. And so Patrick Lindsay, and I would go back to the other slide. In his book, which I would encourage you to pick up, uh, Three Big Questions for a Frantic Family, talks about what makes your family unique. And those are the values. Second question, what is your family's most important priority? Right For Debbie and I right now, we're about to make a transition that we'll talk about a little bit later. We both of us are working heavily on trying to make that uh, this a successful transition, right? Number three, uh, how will you use these answers and keep them alive? And and Patrick Lencioni basically says that families ought to gather together, and they talk about their values, talk about the things that are most important to them, and they ought to have a process by which they keep those things in front of them. So we hope that you take this exercise with you for your family. One thing I also want to to say is we will probably have a few minutes for questions and answers at the end. So if you do have any questions, feel free to use the chat feature and we'll answer them when we get to the end of our time. 
So uh, Lloyd in 2004 took another turn and started working on a master's in theology at Wheaton College. Yes, while I was raising a family, while I was working 50, 60 hours a week, while I was volunteering at my church very heavily. It was a busy time. And then after some period of time with my music career and so forth, I got involved with the, I've always been involved with my kids' school, but I was hired to be a consultant in the Gurney School District 56 in 2005. And then here, Lloyd created his personal mission statement. Now, I mentioned to you that I was doing too much. So by this time, I am pursuing a second master's degree, working 50 hours a week, uh, ha having 30 direct reports that I'm that I'm managing all who were on their own business uh, uh, leading ministries at my church and I'm feeling like I'm drowning and so my wife sends me away for a weekend for prayer with my Bible and I come up with a personal mission statement that ordered my life to this very day and I and what I came back with is that what what I'm about personally is that I am a learner uh, I am a, a, I apply what I learn, I do it, and I'm a teacher. I learn, I do, and I teach. And that explains uh, a lot about my life. Uh, the Catholic grammar school I went to, the Latin School of Chicago for high school, University of Illinois, Kellogg, Wheaton, I'm a learner. And not just officially, but I'm a reader. I, I swallowed the book whole this weekend. Um, I'm known to when I'm interested on a subject, I'm, no, I'm known to be have a voracious appetite for reading and so forth. Uh, I learn, I do, I teach. And so that drives kind of what I do professionally. Uh, I can do a bunch of things. I can, I can lead in sales and in a sales career. I can pastor, but those three things have to be there. I have to be able to learn. I have to be able to apply it, and I have to be able to coach or lead people. Those are the things that make me go. You should know what makes you go. You should have a you should have a good sense for what ignites you. Yeah. Um, so we relocated to Madison, and I took another job switch. By this time, I am uh, making a good chunk of change as a as a sales manager at American Family, but I'm kind of I've been doing that job for ten years, and I'm ready for a change. A good friend of mine. Uh, with the American Family, invited me to take a job uh, in marketing. And so we relocated to Madison. And so we came to Madison in 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been here for 14 years, but we're about to make a, a bit of a transition. Uh, I took a job back to a um, from a management job to an individual contributing job that was a career development position. It quickly led to a director position at American Family which was a great job. That was the job I was at when I ended up leaving uh, American Family. Click on that. So one of the things that has helped us is just putting our relationship first. So a first over work, first over our kids, which we observe a lot of people don't do. But for us, we, yeah. we knew that if we weren't rock solid, then we wouldn't be the best for our kids. So that was one of the things that we just made a priority is just putting each other first. And, and that continues to be like a, a challenge that we have to challenge each other on that mm -hmm. um, to not let both of us like our work and can be very, it can be very consuming for us, but, but um, uh, work can't replace a solid marriage or a solid family. And so we, and so we have worked hard to keep the, our priorities uh, straight. Just keep moving. So I finished the master's in theology in 2012 and 2013. I go to Debbie and I say, honey, I think I'm done at, at American Family and I need to, uh, uh, I feel like God is, is asking me to, to make a career shift after 20 years at American Family, 28 years in corporate. Uh, I apply for and get hired as the senior associate pastor at High Point Church. That's a job I've, I've held now for seven years uh, uh, until here recently uh, getting a new position. Go ahead, Wendy. So when Lloyd um, started working as a pastor, I started to say, well, 
he's going to take another pay cut. So we, mm -hmm. I might need to get a job. So I started working as a client services director for a company here locally called Career Momentum. And at that company is where I started just to learn that, that business of career transition and um, surprisingly really liked it. I'm not very much of a touchy feely kind of person, but I appreciated the work that they did. And it felt like ministry to me being able to take people when they're at their lowest coming in without having lost a job, either voluntarily or involuntarily, and being able to walk them through um, a program and a pathway to get to rebuild their confidence and to get them a job that in many cases they liked better than the, the job they lost. So that was uh, a really pivotal year for us in terms of our careers. It was in 2014 where we celebrated our 25th anniversary. We went uh, to Mexico and had a really great time. Uh, something kind of traumatic happened while we were there. We were riding those all-terrain vehicles and I, um, I didn't run into a tree, but my finger got caught in a tree limb and the diamond from my wedding band flew off into I don't even know where. And it um, really traumatized me because here I am on my 25th anniversary and then I lose my wedding band and my, my ring was mangled and it was a, just a traumatic experience. But um, just it was all a ploy to get a bigger wedding ring that cost a lot more money <laughs> in very short order. <laughs> but it was, uh, just a reminder that the marriage isn't about the ring or the dress or the, the accoutrement. It's about the love that you share and the family that you build and, and the relationship. So that was then. Um, one of the other things that we just really believe is important is that you have to be a dream champion. Be a dream champion for your spouse, be a dream champion for your children. Um, so the question we want you to think about is, are you a, your partner's dream champion? Right. This is a, a tagline from uh, American Family, a place I worked for 20 years. And um, I'm really uh, this this uh, uh, theme, this model for the organization really speaks to me. It really speaks to our marriage and why we've been successful. Um, I've known that my uh, wife loves to, to worship in music. I've known that she it is entrepreneurially minded. I've known that she has a, uh, she's smart, that she's a leader. Um, uh, and I've wanted to nurture and develop that in her. And, and I have felt the same support from her. So we, we're each other's dream partners. Every dream needs a partner. Are you your spouse's dream partner? So, um, another opportunity came up for me, as you can see, my career has been all over the map, but an opportunity came for me to be an adjunct instructor at Edgewood College. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next and um, knew it, it was going to be something I just didn't know. So this opportunity came up and that happened and it was great. I learned a lot about myself and what I would want to do and would not want to do as it relates to instructing people. She worked a lot for no money, for <laughs> low, low money. What, no money? Not, not I have much. a lot of respect for educators now. Um, I had respect before, but even more now. Um, the students were great. The work was challenging, but the pay is horrible. Anyway, um, I was also, at this time, I moved from client services director to a talent management and consultant at Career Momentum. And that was an opportunity that kind of changed the trajectory of a little bit of, of both our lives in terms of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. It was a great opportunity for me to learn that business, but also learn about some skill in me that I just wasn't really aware of. So did Debbie tell the story about how she ended up going into talent management? Did you tell that story real briefly? No. So it, when I left American family to become a pastor, it required Debbie to get at least a part-time job. So, uh, why don't you tell her about how you got that job real quick? So I was in the restroom at church and this woman came up to me. Her name is Clara Knightum. She might even be listening. I don't know. And she came up to me and said, hey, do you want to, you looking for a job? And 
I just thought it was a little weird for somebody to be asking me about a job in the restroom at church. And I was like, well, uh, yeah. And she gave me her business card and said, well, contact me. So I sent her my resume and went in for an interview and um, interviewed with her and the other owner of the business and was hired. And that kind of was the beginning of my career in consulting. Um, at least more consulting than I was doing in Illinois, but really set me up well to be able to do what I'm doing right now. But she started in admin. She she learned that she might have a talent to do the consulting part of it, and then she took a risk and started to consult it. Mm -hmm. So in 2016, after having been at Career Momentum for since the end of 2012, I decided to launch out on my own. Um, there was a lot happening in the community and a lot that I wanted to do. And so I decided I would start my own company doing a little bit of career coaching and maybe some diversity work. And I, um, at the urging of one of my now good friends, Allison Cooley, I um, went and spoke. I filled out an application to be a speaker at the Madison Nonprofit Day Conference. And I didn't know what I was going to talk about. And I wanted to find like a niche to be sure they would choose me. So I decided to speak on um, diversity in fundraising. And they indeed chose me. And it was at that conference that I was able to get my first consulting, my first training client, which led to one of my early consulting clients who is there and they're still one of my clients today but that set me up for success in my business that i just wasn't even sure how it was going to happen and I, along the way i met some great people who kept saying join the national speakers association join the national speakers association so this is part of to it taking a village and finding your network and finding your people the nsa has been my people and they helped me um, really think through how to set up my business, how to how to get um, more speaking gigs, how to do training well, how to plan the business well, and so that that's what I did. Um, I did a, a little bit of resume, career work, and that kind of thing. But early on, just knew that diversity and inclusion was going to be part of my work. Every month the, before the COVID restrictions, the National Speakers Association would have a lunch and training deal, and I would go. And I would be the Deborah's husband. My, my, my tag was like Deborah's husband. And I'm there and she's networking and talking about her business. And I'm just there supporting and nurturing it, being a dream champion. Keep going. So at this in 2018, I, I don't even remember how, but I think it was Sabrina Madison gave my name to uh, Brian Woodhouse at Madison College and was offered a position to be an entrepreneur in residence there, which was very rewarding, having the opportunity to work with um, community members and starting their businesses. So I put this slide together just to show you all the some of the transitions that we've had as, as a couple and just to show you how we wouldn't have been able to make these moves if we hadn't been supportive of each other's careers, each other's dreams, um, uh, not getting caught up in what traditional roles are in the family, but being other, able to just jump in and do what you need to do when you need to do it so that you can see success in your marriage and in your relationship. Well, we've, we've been abundantly blessed and recognized that much of our success, all of our success has hinged upon our, our faith in Christ. Keep moving. 2019. So we celebrated our 30th anniversary last year. We went on a road trip to Florida and toured many places in Florida, which I won't get into. Um, but uh, it was in that same great year. Time. It was a great time. I, I rebranded and renamed and started the People Company to better reflect the work that I do in diversity and inclusion. About 99% of my work is in that space and only a little bit in career management. And so Dream Champion, I read a book by T.G. Jakes on entrepreneurship. He talked about how important your name was. I was like, oh, wife, you got to read this. And that, I think that kind of led to us her rebranding. Rebranding and changing the name to something that really represented my work and that was accessible and people could remember it. Yeah. At the same time, I was elected to the um, Verona Area School District Board of Education. And we're going to run out of time. So I'm not going to tell you that whole story, but I just want you to know that that also happened because of the village that I have. Meredith um, Steer Christensen was instrumental in me even 
being a thought for that position. She was at, we went to church with Meredith. We did go to church with Meredith a while ago. And she, as well as some of my best friends who I have known since I moved to Verona, helped to um, get signatures for me, helped me get elected then. And they also were kind of my campaign team for this recent election where I was just reelected um, this year. Uh, because uh, Black Lives Matter, I spent a lot of time in the public schools mentoring boys. Um, African-American and Latino students. And I wrote a book uh, here uh, last summer that I am going to publish, uh, Boys to Men, How to Mentor, How Men Can Mentor Middle School Boys. That um, maybe if you've got a, a similar interest, I'll make that, uh, I'll get this book ready and published and, and out the door. What's next? So what's next for us? So in 2020, we've had a lot of um, life changes also. Um, again, no. okay. um, so one of the things is, um, you know, I'm, I launched uh, the Inclusion Institute, which is going to uh, be the place where I operate my certified diversity practitioner program online and in person. So we started that last month. So that's been a big change for us. Um, and then Lloyd has news he would like to share. Yeah. And I have uh, recently accepted a senior pastor job in Aurora, Illinois at River Valley Community Church. I'm very excited about uh, that this opportunity. I um, feel like God has been preparing uh, both of us uh, for the, the challenge of, of leading a church that's uh, thriving and has been um, doing well for 17 years and whose pa senior pastor uh, recently retired and is going to be around to help coach me through this next uh, uh, part of our of our journey. A little scary because our sons are going to be here in Madison. One of them is working in his own career. The other one is a, uh, about to wrapping up uh, his career, his uh, college years at UW in education. So they'll they'll be here and we'll be there. <laughs> and so it'll be it'll be different. The first time both of them we've been away from both of them, right? That's right. Yeah. So it'll be that'll be a different phase. And never fear, I am still going to have my business based in Madison. And we'll continue to operate the people company as I always have. We'll just be living a little bit further away. So I'll be commuting here as I need to and supporting the clients that have been so great for me over the time we've been here. So we finished. Um, that's kind of our timeline. We wanted to encourage you to create your own timeline. It was a great exercise for us to really look back mm -hmm. over all of the things that have happened in our life and try to synthesize it down to the key points, but also to um, acknowledge you know, where there were ups, where there were downs, how we look back and say, oh my goodness, how did we get through that? How did we make it through those times? And just a way to acknowledge that Yes, you are strong. You can make it. You can do it. Um, you, it takes, like we said before, the faith, the flexibility, and the fortitude to get through it. But you can do it. And see where what you've learned along the way. So we, one of the things is we talked about it. Don't be afraid to change careers. If, if it's not working, change. If you find a new interest, don't be afraid to try it. There's plenty of opportunities, as you saw in my career. I've done a bajillion things. And also, even before I started working professionally for after college, I had had numerous jobs before that that helped me know that it was OK to, to, to change. And even though I joke about Lloyd's changing jobs, I knew it was OK for him to do it because you know we, we've made these changes and we came out OK. Um, through it all, I would say never lose your sense of humor. Um, there are going to be times that just seem completely ridiculous and you have a choice to get angry and frustrated or you can just laugh through it and enjoy the good times. Um, never go to bed angry. You've heard that a, a million times probably from, on TV and other, and other places, but really try not to do that. Don't let time um, get in between your, you and your partner and your relationship. Um, that will be Letting, letting things fester could be the death of you. So make sure you have fun in your marriage. Do work that you, you can have some joy in, if at all possible. Mm -hmm. Find joy in your work. Laugh often because it's a great way to override some of the negativity that happens in, our, in everybody's life. And it's a great way to lift your mood. Um, 
even though I like money, as Lloyd has said, recognize that money is in everything. If we had made money our priority, we would still be um, very stressed out, working mm -hmm. very high powered jobs, not have had the opportunity to spend with our kids as much as we wanted and to. Maybe not even married. That's true too. Yeah. And we wouldn't have had time to mm -hmm. um, enjoy some of the other things we've already talked about. Um, you mean may need to go down to go up. So um, I've done that several times. Yeah. So we've we've taken mm -hmm. career moves that as young urban professionals, we would not have been, uh, our friends wouldn't have advised us to do some of the things that we did. And we have been uh, content and also uh, gone through the journey to the end, endured to the end and, and always ended up on the upside of things, even when we didn't know how it was gonna work out. So communicate often and every day, set priorities together take time to talk every day. Um, each spouse can establish communication rhythms with your children, never go to bed angry. I'm gonna run through these, plan date nights, plan activities for kids, plan, 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 family vacations, plan financially, that's really important, and plan for your future and also for the unexpected. And then love and respect one another, work hard and sacrifice and be generous as well. Be faithful and have integrity in everything you do in your relationships and with your work. Be honest, don't keep secrets, and exercise some emotional intelligence. Um, be quick to forgive and slow to anger. Extend one another some grace. Watch what you say and how you say it. Can't say enough how important that is. Don't worry about what other people have to say. Worry about each other first. Work with those who want to work with you. That's been great advice for me career-wise. And yeah, me too. And then, Huge advice, actually. Yeah. And encourage one another. So have realistic expectations. Um, your life is not going to be a straight and easy path. So make sure you know that. And that's where that flexibility comes in. So thank you so much for um, spending this time together. I don't know, Andrew, if you got any questions. But if you did... Let us know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Lloyd and and, uh, and Debbie, for for putting that together. Uh, thank you all to uh, the guests tuning in tonight. Now would be the time if you folks did have uh, have any questions. As of right now, there isn't any, but I have one. Okay. Um, so I, you know, obviously, Debbie, I've gotten to know you pretty well, uh, as well as Lloyd. You know, the past couple of weeks, and uh, as someone who just turned thirty this year, recently engaged and and expecting their first child. I, you know, the, you had a great wealth of, uh, of information and good, uh, good snackable tidbits at the end there. But I was wondering if there was something both of you um, that maybe you, you that kind of stuck with you or resonated with you or you felt, um, you know, was played an important role in your 30s, um, you know, as you progressed. I know I know, you know, you guys have lived a lot of life and have done a lot of things. But uh, I'm wondering if there's something that stuck out to you in particular in your 30s. And I'll go ahead and pop off and let you guys think about it and respond. I the 30s were just a really uh, busy time as I remember them. Like, you know, we had both of our kids in our 30s. I had a lot of job changes in my 30s. And um, I would say maybe pace yourself is one thing that comes to mind um, and enjoy that time. I think I got a lot wiser in my 30s, especially when I started to have children. Um, yeah, but making sure you don't, I don't think you'll be bored with life, but just focus on what you have and value the time that the, the, the situations that you're going through at that time. We both um, have lost parents. Those years were just some, some of the tougher years, I would say. But just treasure those experiences while you're going through them because they can shape your character in big ways and make a, a real difference um, in terms of how you how, the, how your forties turn out. Yeah, this was when uh, I was able to really figure out what I was about. Uh, I was being dragged in uh, untold uh, areas, just just way too much going on, and that's when I had to go through that exercise of prayer and reflection, and came out with to learn to to do uh, to teach. So you got to have priorities and you got to know who you are and what you're about and let that drive the decisions you make. 
Wonderful. Thank, thank you for that. I, I, I very much appreciate that. Lots of praise from, from folks uh, here in the comments. Uh, Roger says, hello. Mary Helen sh shares her love. Uh, Carrie stated that uh, she is tuning in on her date night tonight. So that's oh, cool. cool. That's something that, uh, you know, I'm especially time under quarantine being so close mm -hmm. in proximity. I feel, mm -hmm. you know, you, you share the, uh, the nuances of your day almost kind of when they happen and, and, and that time that you would have, whether it's the commute to reflect before you meet someone um, or to really kind of talk about, you know, the events of the day um, in one spot that kind of goes away, right? And then it loses some of its luster. So I'm, I'm trying to do my due diligence in, in mm. planning uh, regular date nights and activities and whatnot, too. So that's good. Okay. You're wise. Good, good, good tidbits there. Um, got some more love. Congrats, Pastor Lloyd and Mrs. Biddle. Thank you from Taylor or Tylee, T A E L I. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so it doesn't look like there's any more comments here. So I think I will go ahead and uh, and wrap it up there. Again, I want to thank the Biddles for for putting this together. Um, I very much enjoyed hearing your story and, and your wisdom shared. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, we are. Oh, we've got one last comment, and Mary said, "Couple goals. Love you guys. Congrats. Post your sermon or go live for all of us who love your preaching." So I'm sure <laughs> that will happen. But. Uh, Yes, uh, thank you all again for, for tuning in. We uh, we do put a lot of, we have been putting out a lot of these sorts of videos, various topics in this quarantine time. You can go to facebook.com forward slash Dream Bank MSN, uh, probably the page you're looking at right now. But uh, yeah, we'll see you folks next time. All right. Thanks a lot. Take okay. care.